Okay, you're welcome to start. Have a good session. Are we starting? Yes, you can. Yes, sorry, I, I was in the other session until now. Uh, so, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to this session on side channel analysis in which we have four talks. Uh, I'm Leila Batina. I'm chairing this together with Jen Jen Bao. Uh, I see you're also in the session. Okay, so uh, yeah, I guess then we can start. Uh, the first speaker. Uh, can you share your slides? So the first talk is uh, collaboration from uh, free authors from uh, Bochum, uh, David Knihel, Pascal Sazric, and Amir Moradi. And David will give the talk. Uh, the the title of this talk is uh, Silver, Statistical Independence and Leakage Verification. Uh, David, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Actually, I'm, I'm not David. Unfortunately, he's sick. So my name is Pascal Zastrich. Oh. And um, yeah, it, it was a last minute. Feel that. Yeah. Um, but I will give the talk and um, I will present our new tool called Silver. That is um, used for leakage verification based on statistical independence. As, as we heard, this is a joint contribution from our colleagues, uh, David Knichel, Amir Morali, and me. So, um, so you may ask, um, why do we need another tool for verification of mask implementations if we already have some good tools at hand? So I would like to start with a brief motivation for, for our tool. So basically, the problem of side channel analysis is well known for more than 20 years now, and we have some good understanding on theoretically sound countermeasures, such as masking. So why do we need tools for verification at all? Um, in fact, security assessment of mask circuits, as of today, is still a manual and very error-prone task. Although we have some basic security notions that should assist designers in creating secure circuits, um, the view on those security notions is somehow fragmented. So the idea is to use tool-assisted formal verification as early as possible during the design cycle to avoid problems at later stages. Um, in particular, mask verif has been a very um, good state-of-the-art tool until now, offering a wide range of features. But unfortunately, um, mask verif is a language-based tool, and its verification approach is uh, not in direct conformity with the security notions that are used during the design phase. So in a worst case scenario, the tool may even report false negatives. So our challenge and our goal was to build an easy to use sound and complete verification tool that is in direct conformity with all recent security notions. So the question now is, um, how do we achieve this? How do we avoid false negatives and build a sound and complete verification tool? And for this, we observed that um, any wire within the digital logic circuit can be modeled as a binary random variable and that, can, that we can use the probabilities of both events, so the event of um, having a one or observing a zero, that we can use the probabilities of both events to verify statistical independence. And we further showed how we can efficiently reduce the complexity of this verification and the computation of statistical independence of joint distributions of a random bi uh, binary random variables. But for this, um, I would like to refer to the full presentation of the paper. What we then did is um, using the redefinition of all state-of-the-art security notions based on statistical independence, we could verify security for um, a standard and a software-like, um, so a standard, a software-like and a glitch extended hardware-like leakage model. And for all this, our verification approach heavily relies on the data structure of reduced orbit binary decision diagrams um, to store Boolean functions, and that allows us to efficiently derive the probability distributions of binary random variables. So eventually, combining all this into our tool, we can work on a synthesized very long netlist, which is first parsed and converted to some intermediate and custom netlist format. And this file then is used to generate the BDDs, and the analyzer evaluates the various security notions based on statistical independence of intermediate and secret values. 
So as a result, as you can see on the right side, the report will provide the maximum security order for um, each security notion that we analyze and also for each um, leakage model, as well as the first combination of probes that fails for the given test. In order to evaluate the performance and the efficiency of our tool, we performed an extensive set of tests of different mask gadgets, as well as full S-boxes and other Boolean functions that we found in the literature. So here you can see um, the results for different mask gadgets that we analyzed. And most interestingly, um, our tool also could confirm the manual found flaws in several schemes, such as the CMS3 or the UMA2 that, that you can see in, in the last lines here. Um, besides single mask gadgets, we also um, analyzed several mask S boxes and Boolean functions for their security properties, as you can see on, in the table on this slide. So before concluding this talk, um, I briefly would like to discuss the benefits, but also the limitations of our approach. So as we intended to build a sound, complete and easy to use uh, tool, our framework supports all recent and established security notions and composability notions in software and hardware-based leakage model. Further, um, Silver avoids false negatives, enhances in direct conformity with the formal security definitions for uh, the, the various security notions. And eventually our tool is designed to assist designers in fixing the flaws as quick as possible. For instance, um, in reporting the first set of probes that failed uh, the security evaluation and hence guiding the designers in fixing the flaws. But on the downside, due to its direct conformity with the security notions, um, Silver cannot use optimizations that were used for recent language-based tools such as MassVerif and hence in comparison um, is slower as such approaches. So in conclusion, conclusion, we can say Silver is an easy to use tool for sound and complete verification of the security and composability of mask implementations. And if you're interested in the tool, um, I would like to refer you to our GitHub page where you can find the tool, but also you, um, I here I provide the link to our document if you're interested in, in the details. And if you have any comments or if you have any questions on the code or the document, please feel free to reach out to me or my colleagues um, using the email address that you can find on this slide. Um, so with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions. Okay, we have a question from C. Uh, uh, is transition leakage considered the register HD in silver? Um, not yet. So currently we are just considering um, glitches as physical defaults, but we don't consider transition leakage um, in, in our tool so far. But of course, this is something we probably would consider for future work. Uh, I have also a question, Pascal, so thanks for your talk. Um, so how does it compare with the uh, uh, measurements from real hardware? Did you verify uh, the tool? Like, yeah, the comparison. Um, so we, we did some measurements um, on, on some different gadgets. Um, and, but so our approach was there, we used the tool first for verification. And as soon as the tool reported that the gadgets or the S-boxes were secure, we also did some physical measurements and they confirmed um, the results so far. But of course, this, this wasn't really extensive. We just had two or three S-boxes where we did this, but mm -hmm. at least for this, um, the, the results were confirmed. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, a question on, on, on your uh, performance uh, remark. So when you say it's not so efficient, what does it mean? So how long would it take to, to verify uh, a whole round of AES? Um, yeah, so the problem there is we are currently limited in the size of the underlying data structure. So as I said, we are using the BDDs as a data structure mm -hmm. and um, the, so we are limited in, in the size of the BDDs. Um, okay. At least the, or in fact, the, the complex part is the generation of the BDDs. Mm -hmm. As soon as we would have the BDDs, verification is very fast, but generation of the BDDs is very complex and time consuming. And in fact, we, we didn't manage to um, generate BDDs for a full round so far. We are still investigating on that. So 
Um, in fact, the, the performance is limited with, uh, with respect to the size of the circuits and also for higher orders. So we did testing up to order three, but beyond that, um, there's of, of course the, the complexity increases because we have too many combinations to probe. Mm -hmm. And this is also some limitation currently. Okay, yeah. So some 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 things for future work, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks again. Uh, I guess we should move on to our uh, next talk in this session. Uh, the speaker. Uh, so the next talk is uh, cryptanalysis of mask ciphers, a not so a random idea. It's a joint work of Tim Beine, Simon Doge, and Jenda Zhang. And Simon will give the talk. Okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so in short, this work is about side channel analysis uh, and masking, and we propose a security analysis to verify whether a uh, masking is probing secure. You might wonder why uh, another security analysis is needed. Well, our security analysis is based on crypt analysis. That means we uh, consider bounded query security. Instead, most uh, security analyses consider perfect security. And this will allow us to uh, reduce costs and typically randomness costs. Um, for those that know threshold implementations, uh, we allow for the uh, creation and verification of higher order multivariate secure threshold implementations. And our analysis includes the randomness generation. So if there is an RNG present in the algorithm, you can actually include it in the security analysis as well. In our work, in the uh, example we give, the randomness is generated uh, the randomness is simply uh, reduced as much as possible. So the RNG is quite trivial. And we will see the importance of cryptanalytic properties. So the diffusion layers of uh, the cipher we're going to mask is important and the nonlinearity of its masked SBOX is important. We use a bounded query security model. This is a left-right security model where the adversary picks two secrets. The challenger picks one of those two, creates a masked circuit, gives that to the adversary, which can probe this masked circuit Circuit, the circuit gives back the probed values. And the advantage of the adversary is decided by the entropy of those probed values. So what we want to show is that those probed values are uniformly randomly distributed. And we show that this entropy can be bounded in terms of the non-trivial Fourier coefficients of its distribution. You might think, how is that useful? We can actually give a bound on these Fourier coefficients using standard linear cryptanalysis. So Basically, it just reduces to finding trails in the masked cipher. Um, and so to give an easy example, consider LED. And for all intents and purposes, consider that this is a yes, so mixed columns and a shift rows operation. Um, consider that we place two probes, so second order masking. If you place the first probe in the top left S box, uh, consider that that's the input mask of your trail. You're going to go through the activity pattern of the uh, cipher. You can see here two rounds further. If I place a second probe, I would activate, let's say, a second probe in the S box, activate only one cell. You see that the output mask is only one cell, whether the activity pattern is the entire state. So that means that there is a zero correlation approximation, which means that two rounds are perfectly probing secure. But instead, if you um, place your probes four rounds apart, you can actually find trails, you do find correlation, but that correlation is bounded by the maximum absolute correlation of the mast S box and the number of active S boxes. So more concretely, uh, the advantage of the adversary for this example was bounded by the square root of the number of queries divided by two to the 120. And this sharing requires quite a lot of state shares. So seven state shares, it's not required, but this was just for ease, but mainly the sharing requires only 664 bits of randomness. And that includes the masking of the plain text and the key. And so in short, our work is just about using linear crypt analysis to analyze the probing security of mass primitives. So it kind of gives the um, interaction between symmetric key crypt analysis and masking. We show, and as far as I know, uh, first with um, normal masking methods that fresh randomness is not needed for second order security. And we find that some symmetric primitives are easier to secure than others. ES is quite difficult because of its S box and present for its diffusion layers. Interesting future work would be, well, we needed good cryptanalytic properties of masked S-boxes. No one has investigated that, so that would be interesting. 
We used the probing model, but it would be interesting to find the bound in the noisy leakage model. I think that's a difficult point, but it would be interesting. And we said that we could, you can include the RNG. I think that's worth further investigation. And with that, I would like to leave it if you have any questions. Thanks, Simon. Thanks for your talk. Do we have questions? Uh, I haven't a question in Julie. No questions in chat. Uh, so, so maybe just uh, to, to clarify here, uh, the statement that fresh randomness is not needed for second order security, but it is for first. Can you? Also not. Also not. But, so, um, yeah. There we have two works. Uh, there we have the, the typical threshold implementations, mm -hmm. the first order threshold implementations. And for AES, you can reduce fresh randomness using the changing of the guards method. So there is mm -hmm. these works uh, that reduce all fresh randomness from the AES in first order. And here we can see that we can also do that for second order. So you kind of uh, use the idea of uh, changing the guards for uh, second order as well, and then generalizing to higher orders. That's something left so, for future. Yes, order. so it would be, it's definitely possible. Um, yeah. You can uh, create, let's say third order non-complete and uniform sharings, but then you would need something like 11 to 15 shares. Um, so it's better to say, and the analysis gets a whole lot more complex for every security order you go up. Um, so it's it's definitely worth future research how mm -hmm. to do this in an efficient way. And then uh, performance is also kind of yeah questionable. Yeah, so, how uh, how feasible would that be for like real world applications? Like yeah, exactly. So currently we're investigating um, how to uh, secure. Uh, second order efficiently. So for example, we can now make the LED with only three shares instead of um, seven. So then it becomes mm -hmm. actual normal masking, let's say. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it would be interesting. Any, to... any limitation in terms of ciphers? Like here you have AES and present. Uh, so do you are... require certain properties in terms of uh, symmetric primitives you, you could apply your method to? So we are currently investigating how to secure the AES um, mm -hmm. because there you do need the changing of the guards methods and essentially changing of the guards is introducing a Feistel network in the uh, cipher and that just reduces the security because the diffusion just gets worse. Mm -hmm. And that is basically what you see. Present is known to be weak against linear crypt analysis and now that, yeah, that comes back, that property. That's yeah. why present is difficult to, mm -hmm. I should specify, it's difficult to reduce the randomness cost for a masking of present. Mm -hmm. um, but there are indeed um, good diffusion layers, uh, slow saturation in the diffusion mm -hmm. is good. So AES is actually, has one of the best diffusion layers you can think of. It slowly diffuses and still activates a lot of S boxes. Mm -hmm. But it, I guess it would be also interesting to consider uh, the, uh, the new NIST lightweight competition candidates with respect to this, right? Definitely, definitely. Uh, mm -hmm. Some are going to be easier than others. Ciphers mm -hmm. that follow the white trail strategy design are going to be a bit easier because these uh, properties are kept if you mask it, so you don't need to research mm -hmm. it all over again. Some primitives you do need to use SMT solvers for, and then you do go down more to the engineering level to, to try and verify this. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for your Thank talk. You. Uh, Zhen Zhen, no, no further questions from the audience, no? No. OK, no. yeah, I guess I guess we can move on. Thanks. Thank you. Um, OK, see. so our next talk uh, is entitled Pact Multiplication, How to Amortize the Cost of Side Channel Masking. And it's a collaboration of uh, several authors <laughs> uh, from China and Belgium. And uh, the first author, Wei Yai Wang, I hope I pronounced it correctly, will give the talk. Yeah. <laughs> so please go ahead. Uh, thanks, thanks for the introduction. Uh, uh, hello, I'm uh, Wei Jia Wang at Shandong University. I'm going to uh, present the work about the masking technique. Uh, here it's called the packed multiplication. Uh, this work is joint with Chunguo, uh, Frank Savan, uh, uh, the VL standard, UU and Keaton Kazeers. 
so masking is one of the most investigated uh, countermeasure against the side channel attack. A masking scheme is made up of two integrants. The first one is usually is called encoder and it randomizes each sequence variable CX here into a number of shares here, uh, such as any D uh, shares are independent of the X. So we can see that the encoder provided the security for the sequence variable such as key. Besides, we also need to secure the computation, which requires a segment ingredient, the private computation. Uh, here I give an example. Say we want to compute x plus y times z, uh, where the x, y, z are uh, separate variables such as key. Uh, what we can do is to transform each elemental operation into their mass correspondence, uh, whose input and output are both shares. Uh, here, for example, here uh, the addition is transformed to addition gadget and the uh, multiplication is transformed to the multiplication gadget. Uh, after those transformations, we can transform an unprotected computation to a protected one, ensuring that any D uh, intermediates are independent of the input circuit. Uh, usually we call this kind of security as deep privacy or deep proving security. So this is the basic idea of masking. In this work, we are interested in reducing the computation um, overhead of the mask nonlinear operations or mask or, 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 the, or nonlinear gadget, which is a challenge regarding uh, to the practical usage of the masking technique. And we consider both computational complexity and randomness complexity. A nature idea of doing this is to concentrate on designing more efficient gadget and many previous work devoted to such direction and try to push the limits of the gadget. Overall, this approach considers every gadget separately and we can call it as isolating approach. So uh, on the other hand, we can we note that the cryptographic algorithm typically consists of executing a basic function for many times in parallel. Uh, so in our work takes we take a global view and apply the optimization uh, technique, which aim at reducing the average uh, overhead, the average uh, complexity for the masking of several uh, operations. So, which means that the more uh, parallel modifications we have, the lower average cost. As a result, we propose a new construction, which named packed modification, which computes the multiple uh, masked modifications in parallel. So in the following, we denote the vector of shares related to, uh, related to a, a sensitive variable as sharing. So for, is, for instance, the Boolean sharing of uh, a sensitive variable X here, are uh, X hat zero to X hat D, and we will call this vector of D plus one shares as a share. So, and the number of parallel modifications is denoted as L. So as true in the left, if we use the classical local approach, uh, the two input vectors are viewed as several pairs of shares, and each of the pairs is possessed independently. So in contrast, as shown in the right, our packed modification considers the modification over finite field and it has two steps. First, uh, each input vector is re-encoded into a packed sharing using a linear code. The size of the data here is compact from uh, two times D plus one times L to two times D plus L. Uh, then a computation over the packed sharing is calculated resulting in Boolean sharing, uh, and the data size is returned back to D plus one times L. Uh, so here I give an example to illustrate the theoretical performance gain for the masked uh, 16 S boxes in one AES round using our approach. Uh, the, AES S box uh, was designed as an inverse in the finite field of two to the eight, which can be decomposed into four modifications and several linear operations. Uh, when we use the isolating approach with SW modification, we need to implement the 16 S boxes separately. It requires uh, this amount of, I mean, this requires, uh, requires 64 uh, D square by linear modifications and 64 uh, D times D plus one divided by two random bytes. But when it comes to the case of our packed modifications, only four packed modifications, uh, which L equals 16 are needed. And thanks to the optimization, it requires much less uh, 
a number of much smaller number of bilinear medications and random bites. And we showcase our new method on ASR by step, which consisting of 16 S boxes. The S boxes are implemented with secret orders four and eight based on the ARM Cortex M architecture. And we can see that when the secret order D equals eight, our I mean implementation achieves. I mean, compared to the state of art, uh, achieves a gain of up to 30 percentage in total speed and saves uh, up to 60 percentage random bits than the state of art bit size implementation reported at HRQ 2008, uh, 2018. Uh, so, since for now, we only consider the implementation with proven security, which is a necessary first step. We think it, it is quite an interesting and open problem to look at the concrete security of the proposal. Okay, finally, I would like uh, to give a short conclusion. So this work focus on the, focuses on the overhand of the cell channel masking technique. We consider many parallel uh, mask operations and reduce the, uh, reduce the average randomness and computational cost via the optimization. So that's thanks for that is thanks for listening. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. Uh, do we have questions from the audience or comments? Zhenzhen, you are muted. Yes. Uh, yes, from uh, Georgian. Uh, uh, do you have to remask a value if you want to use it twice in your parallel multiplication? Yeah, can you see? Uh, uh, yeah, actually, yes. I mean, if you if we have two, um, uh, I, I mean, if I have two uh, several uh, parallel medications in sequence, I mean, in serial, and we have to remark the, the the value twice. I mean, but but we can do it. But I mean, considering that, for example, for ES, we have sixteen S boxes in parallel, so we can first do the sixteen. Uh, as box, uh, we can do the 16 modifications together, then we do another 16 modifications between them. We can do some, we need to do some remask. Yeah. And, and of course, it is quite an interesting open problem, problem that to analysis that if, how can we do to avoid the remask? I mean, can we, I mean, which means that can we, uh, generalize, generalize this approach to the case of serial implementation. Mm -hmm. No more questions? Um, no more no? questions from chat. Mm. Okay, yeah, maybe later uh, if we still have time after the last talk. So I propose we move to the last uh, talk in this session. Thanks, uh, Veja. Uh, Thanks. The final talk in this session is on side channel information set decoding using iterative chunking. And it's a joint work of Norman Lahr, Ruben Niederhagen, uh, Richard Petri, and Simona Samajiska. And Simona will give the talk. Uh, hi, um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so I'm giving this short uh, talk and uh, Norman is giving the long talk. He couldn't make it uh, today. So uh, let me start. So the focus of our work is uh, the classic Michaelis uh, uh, finalist for a key encapsulation mechanism in the NIST PQC uh, standardization uh, process. So just a very quick introduction. So this crypto system is actually based on the Niederreiter uh, crypto system and uses the COPA codes which, com which comes from the original uh, Michaelis. And just to be able to follow the talk, it is parameterized by uh, the code length and the code dimension uh, K uh, and uh, uh, the T, which is the guaranteed error correction uh, capability as well as the field size. So uh, the McAleese uh, team uh, proposes these following um, 
uh, parameter uh, sets. Uh, in the this is for the second uh, round um, uh, uh, submission, and we are interested now in attacking uh, uh, classic Michaelis. So there are two approaches of how to attack classic Michaelis. You could try to find the private uh, key or uh, solve uh, a decoding problem. So solving the decoding problem actually leads to plain text recovery. So what is the decoding problem in this case, given a, a priority check matrix and a ciphertext uh, uh, S, find uh, an error vector such that this uh, equation here is uh, satisfied. The error vector has uh, uh, prescribed weight T um, and a length uh, uh, N. So if you're able to solve this, you basically get the plaintex recovery. Our focus is on the decoding uh, problem. So actually the, the, the standard uh, best attacks on uh, classic Michaelis are also uh, the ones that solved uh, the decoding problem. So how do we do this? So we uh, combine two things, a reaction attack and information set decoding. Just to recall, a reaction attack is uh, a sort of attack where the attacker actually has access to a decryption uh, oracle. And uh, the decryption oracle just says, uh, uh, yes, uh, I, I managed to decrypt or no, I didn't. So either success or uh, fail. So uh, an important thing in, in a reaction attack is to be able to have this uh, decryption oracle. And sometimes it can be an explicit one where the decryption oracle really tells this, or it can be some sort of a side channel information which we use in our uh, case. The other ingredient is information set decoding, which is the state of the art uh, type of uh, attack for uh, decoding where an attacker actually needs to correctly guess uh, an information set that is a k-bit sub vector of the uh, error vector. And then uh, you can find the entire uh, error vector by a simple linear uh, algebra. Uh, so what are the main contribution? Well, we introduced a new technique, uh, which we call iterative uh, chunking, which is basically uh, a modification of, or, or a version of a reaction-based uh, uh, attack. Uh, where we um, uh, do it cumulatively, and you, I will show you uh, shortly. Uh, the thing is that this significantly uh, reduces the attack error uh, compared to not using this technique uh, by 90% uh, in terms of how many traces uh, we need for the attack. We carefully analyze our technique uh, to see what are the possibilities uh, for the technique and determine what are the optimal parameters and what is the optimal strategy. and uh, on top of that, we apply the ISD um, uh, and ISD algorithm. It can be a, a, a one from many known ISD algorithms. We have uh, we have calculated this for uh, for two of them. And uh, uh, if we uh, take a look at the two strategies, they they kind of are opposed one to another. So the direction attack uh, uses queries, uh, where the ISD attack uses computational uh, power. So there is some sort of a trade-off, and we uh, estimated this uh, uh, trade-off. And for an attacker with a typical uh, computational power of two to the forty uh, uh, operations, so we have a further reduction of around twelve twelve uh, percent. We didn't do just uh, theoretical work. We practically uh, evaluated an attack uh, using simulation, but also performed a real uh, practical side channel attack where on the uh, official FPGA implementation of uh, classic Michaelis. And in our case, we use the EM uh, leakage on this reference implementation, but it's also possible to use uh, power leakage. So uh, what is the idea with the reaction attack uh, here? Uh, uh, we need a decryption oracle, which is the FPGA uh, implementation. And in our case, it's a Berlin messy decoder with a constant time implementation. Although we used uh, um, a previous work as an inspiration, it is very different because they mounted uh, a timing attack with a totally different uh, decoder. So uh, well, we couldn't use uh, uh, time, uh, time differences, uh, but we noticed that when the uh, decoder's capacity is exceeded, there is a, a power uh, leakage. So the error locator polynomial that has been computed du during uh, decoding, uh, um, when, when there is a, a failure of decoding, is just a random uh, polynomial that has very few uh, roots. 
And this means that the resulting error vector has a very low Hamming weight. And this is uh, the power consumption of the entire uh, decoding. And what is important is that in the last uh, uh, part, uh, our simula simulation revealed that when uh, the, the, the real, um, when a valid error uh, locator pro polynomial is constructed, uh, we do have like a higher uh, uh, power consumption. And uh, when it's uh, just a low Hamming weight vector, then it's like just uh, straight. So uh, how do we recover uh, the error vector now that we know that it is possible to have a, a decryption uh, oracle? Well, we test each position of the error vector uh, by uh, flipping a bit. So in our case, this, this uh, means that we add a column of the a parity check matrix uh, to the syndrome. Just to see this, here I have noted like when we add like well, on these uh, one positions, we add these uh, columns uh, here. And if we want to flip a bit, uh, let's say this bit uh, here, we need to add one more uh, column. So this is uh, this case. So this is what we uh, what we get. And when we have uh, more uh, errors in the uh, uh, in the error vector, then we will have a fail. Uh, of the decoding. And if we flip a one to zero, we will have less errors. And then this will uh, just go through and the decode normally. So we, we do have a, a good uh, oracle. The effort is uh, K queries because we, we only need to, be, uh, to recover an information set. So what if we ask uh, the oracle for uh, two error positions at once? So this is the iterative uh, chunking uh, thing. Well, we can see from this table here uh, that uh, if we have two errors at once, then the, the weight of the uh, error vector changes by two. And if uh, W is set to be at the uh, decoding capacity, we will see that the Oracle will return false only in this case and true in all the other uh, cases. So we can detect uh, uh, this case. And uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, with only using this idea with just two errors, we already have an improvement of more than 35%. But we can do this for uh, larger chunks. And this is uh, a bit uh, tricky because we can do it only iteratively and only after we have a, um, uh, already one identified and found and removed. So the, the, the details are in the, um, uh, in the paper. And, um, uh, because uh, as, as B gets larger, there is a higher probability to hit a, a one. Uh, there are, is an optimal uh, uh, beta when, when to stop uh, increasing uh, the chunks. And we have also calculated uh, uh, this. So uh, my final uh, slide shows the results. And uh, for the McAleese uh, parameters uh, here, uh, we see that uh, compared to not using uh, uh, the iterative chunking, there is a huge improvement. And uh, here I have a graph showing the trade-off between, uh, between the two uh, number of queries to complexity. So if an attacker has more computational power, then uh, he can reduce the number of queries and vice versa. Thanks. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, please. Thanks, Simona. We have uh, maybe time for one or two questions. So we're almost running out of time. So uh, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, there is a question in the chat. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, it can be used for other code-based uh, crypto systems. And uh, I, I see it, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The question is, can it be used for other code-based crypto systems? Um, Yes, because this is the uh, they just uh, works with uh, any uh, a decryption oracle as long as uh, you are able to find some side channel uh, uh, information of some sort of leakage in the decoding algorithm that can tell you whether uh, uh, the decoding succeeded or not. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, everything else uh, would apply. Um, how difficult would it be to fix this side channel leakage and what would be the overhead then on implementation? Uh, so, yeah, I'm not an expert on, you know, on fixing uh, side channel issues, but I would say that 
uh, it needs to a little care needs to be put into the constructing of the error vector in the last phase and potentially the phase before that where the error locator polynomial is being uh, constructed because it's a in this case it's just a random polynomial which is very different from the one that is uh, actually uh, produced when we have a uh, valid uh, decoding so um, i would say that uh, if if it is possible somehow to make this one be more similar, or that's one uh, uh, point, or when constructing uh, the error vector to uh, try to um, um, uh, even out the procedures in one case or the other, then uh, it won't be difficult. I don't think there will be a too big uh, overhead, mm -hmm. but sorry, I don't, yeah, not an expert. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Oh, thank you. There are no more questions, I guess. So I guess we can close here. Uh, thanks to all the speakers of this session.